Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo back here with a quick part two. We're actually going to try and finish up our discussion with Fred Schendel and Steve Babb from Glass Hammer because the Zoom video conferencing tool cut us off at 40 minutes when Fred was right in the middle of the story. So, Fred, I'm going to ask you to kind of retell this whole story again about re-recording the first album. Um, well, Steve decided that it might be fun to have an extra to go with a re-release of Middle Earth album, right? Yeah. And it was basically, why don't we go back to Journey of the Dunedin and take one of those songs and just kind of knock up a little uh, remake of it, something new to have as a bonus feature. And he asked, how long would it take to do Song of the Dunedin? And I said, I don't know, two afternoons, maybe, you know, just like program some drums and just kind of, you know, it out and it'll be kind of cool and people will dig it and, you know, yay. So once we actually started doing it, uh, I kind of realized that, hey, I really actually, this is a, a pretty good song. It's pretty cool going back and listen to this. And uh, hearing it realized the way that uh, we would have done it today, almost 30 years later, if we had the kind of technology available now that we did then. And I'll be honest, uh, it's been probably at least 20 years or more since I've listened to that album. It kind of gives me a little twitch in the eye. I'm kind of scared and horrified of it because of just various aspects of it. I think there's, you know, great, great music on it, but, you know, the way that uh, we had to cut some corners originally kind of makes me a little squeamish. So um, actually listening to it and then having a chance to redo it up to um, our, uh, our uh, current uh, musical, uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Standards, I hate to say know that we didn't have standards back then but uh, <laughs> we did the best we could i mean you yeah, guys exactly. spoiled this over you've spoiled this over the years i mean I, I i will admit too i haven't listened to journey in a long time and i remember the last time i did listen to it after you know you guys have so many albums and you know since then it sounds a little dated oh, right just yeah. because of it but it, it's a it's it's of its time right yeah, we're not going to, we're not, we always said before, we, we would never do a George Lucas and like Star Wars Christmas special and try to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> I try to pretend it doesn't exist. Sort of some, but this is our chance to kind of have the best of both worlds now and take that music and redo it. And once we started doing that, we decided, well, you know, why not go ahead and do something's coming too. We already had a, a newly realized version of the opening of the album uh, the shadows of the past section had been done in 2010 or 2011 and i was actually really really happy with that so um now it's turning out to be about a 20 minute album side suite considering the first three songs and the uh, final song on the album all redone and i think it sounds just amazing i'm really actually very proud of it yeah i think people are going to really be surprised when they hear it and it's actually led to us discussing maybe trying to do more or less the whole album at some point. Uh, maybe dropping, dropping a song or two that we'd be happy to see go away. But uh, do the rest of it. And we, there might be a, uh, a fully re-recorded Journey of the Dunedin in the future. But for right now, we definitely have at least 20 minutes of it. And it sounds pretty cool. So where, and again, and now that we've got some extra time here and I'm going totally off the cuff with questions because I think this all makes for great conversation. So where, for you guys, where did you think in your discography were things really starting to click for you? Because, you know, you talk about how you listened to the early albums. It's been fun to go back and kind of redo them in the way that you would do them now. Uh, which album really do you think the true Glass Hammer really started to kind of reveal itself? I'm I'm pretty sure we agree on this. We can actually say it together, right? Three, two, one. Chronometry. Chronometry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, every album was magical to me at the time and love them all, proud of them all, mostly. Uh, but in 2000, uh, I went on vacation for a week. And when I came home, uh, Fred had basically done this entire uh, uh, piece. I, I don't know how to describe it, but a lot of music that he thought would be on a solo album for himself. And I quickly said, no, 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 no. <laughs> this needs to be Glass Hammer. And uh, so I started throwing lyrics at it and we got this unusual guy to come sing it. And uh, and I mean, we were on the map before, I think, because we were one of the original third wave bands. 
but chronometry is where I think everybody kind of woke up and said, oh, they, they're serious. But it's also the point at which we quit trying to be modern. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's or commercial in any way. Yeah, right, right. And we decided, yeah, you're right, because I think we had still entertained some of those fantasies. But I believe, you know, we just began to embrace the nostalgic aspects of what we loved about Prague, which wasn't about pioneering anything new. It was about going back and revisiting the old and the things that we loved about it. And, and it clicked. Of course, the story was, I think, hysterical, but kind of resonated with everybody. It's about the ultimate prog rock fan, throwing some crazy science fiction and, and aliens and things like that. And suddenly you had a band that uh, could, could laugh at itself. And I think that's, that's important in progressive rock because it's most of the artists or a lot of them, at least you assume, take themselves very seriously. Yeah. And we do not. We do not. I, I, I wanted it to be kind of a, the Seinfeld of, of prog rock albums. It's not really an album about anything other than itself. Uh, and people just, they just loved it. And then the follow up was Lex Rex. Well, after the Middle Earth album, which was kind of a hiccup. But, <laughs> Lex Rex came next and, and, and we were taken very seriously. That's when Near Fest happened for us. So. Yeah, I remember when I first heard Chronometry, um, you know, for, I loved the album cover and then the story behind it. Because you remember, I've, I've had, I reviewed all of these albums. I mean, yeah. all, yeah. all these years. So it's like, it, for me, it's like every New Glass Hammer release was an event and an excuse to really dive deep into an album and talk yeah. about it, write about it, that sort of thing. And I remember when that album came out, I also detected a kind of little shift there and all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty serious. And I honestly, I think I even like Lex Rex better as much as I, yeah. both of them are just fantastic albums. And it's like, and there has been this constant quality ever since. Good. So well, that's good. One of the, one of the, and I, mean, I guarantee it's going to happen. I'd rather come from you guys. I guarantee you there's going to be 80% of the people who are going to watch this interview are going to be very familiar with you guys and just loving the conversation. There's going to be 20% who are going to be like, I've never listened to glass hammer before. And they're going to say to me, can you recommend two or three albums that I should go check out first? I want you guys to tell them which ones to check. In your opinion, which are the three glass hammer albums that someone brand new to the band, but knows a bit of Prague should go and listen to. You know, it, it may differ between the two of us. I would, say probably Lex Rex, just to kind of get a feeling of what we're really about. Um, the Inconsolable Secret, which was the most ambitious thing we ever attempted. Uh, and it, it means a lot to me. I mean, I put a lot of time into the lyrics and the story. Uh, and then I would jump to this last album, Dreaming City, because it's actually tied to the Inconsolable Secret. So, you know, as a band, we've sort of over the years have stumbled into making our own mythos, kind of creating this world from which our albums are going to spring, I think more so now than, than ever. So that, that would be my three. Um, chronometry, of course, would be certainly be an extra sort of great album. Yeah, but, but we always struggle with this kind of a question because every album is so different. It's like it's impossible to some extent, I feel like they're like you know, your kids, right? It's like you know, it's like you know, yeah. which which Frank Zappa album? Everyone is so <laughs> radically different. You can't get a an overview of what he's like from really just picking a couple albums. But there are some seminal albums, and uh, I think Inconsolable Secret definitely is one. I would probably have to go with Lex Rex too. Uh, it's tempting to go with Dreaming City for the third one, but I think I'll actually go with If. Oh yeah, that was yeah. another milestone kind of turning point. Yeah, important CD, and it's a good one. So I think those would be my three. Yeah. But yeah, Chronometry and Dreaming City would be kind of lurking right under those three. I couldn't argue with any of those. I, I definitely you know, wouldn't pick Paralandra as like you know something to throw on them at first. But in the '90s, I would have picked it. It's a great. Yeah. But it, but you guys have changed so much since then. That's like yeah, that was Paral very. Yeah. Paralandra is just undoubtedly my favorite of anything prior to 2000 in chronometry but it's it's good out that's another one we've talked about maybe extending this remake project to uh you know maybe grab a couple songs off of every cd from the 90s see, from the 90s and see what we can do with them not in the sense that we're disowning the originals but uh just in a you know hey it's kind of like we did with the remixes of inconsolable secret 
just, hey, what would this music sound like in an alternate universe where it was created at a different time? Well, we're covering our own stuff. It's, you know, yeah. you can do it with other bands. Why not do it with your own? All the big bands have done it, right? They've gone That's and right. they've re-recorded albums and songs. And it's like, you know, why not? Yeah. Why not? But so. to be fair, I think, you know, we did get, we'd been around for years. Uh, and then suddenly, and I understand why, suddenly you would read comments about us being a yes clone. And that was never our intention. I think right. in 2010 with, with John Davison, certainly we were looking for that kind of voice. It's undeniable. And we played with the yes sound more than we determined that's what we're going to do. That was never the point. Uh, I think if you listen to most of those songs, you won't hear yes at all. Now you're going to hear glass hammer and you'll know what it is. Uh, but yeah, I think so. I, I hope that people that that 20% that's not familiar with us, uh, will give us a chance on something because uh, there's a great variety of sound over the last 19 albums. Uh, we've done all kinds of things and still lots of things we, we can do in the future to keep people uh, interested, I hope. Yeah, and actually I've got to throw in uh, two other things. So Three Cheers for the Broken Hearted is an album that was very controversial when it came out because people viewed it as, I guess, a form of selling out. And the idea that, oh, no, they're trying to go commercial. And uh, it, it was a departure, but it, it was a conscious effort to go with shorter, more self-contained songs. We were trying to write good songs, and not necessarily epics. But I think it's an album that people are finally starting to revisit about 10 years later. And they, they hear what we heard in it back when we did it. That's actually one of the Glass Hammer albums that if I'm in the mood to listen to us, I pull that one out because I think it's incredibly good sounding and I think it's got a lot of really, really, really good songs on it. And I, I personally really like that album. And uh, uh, what was the other? Oh, the other one is Valkyrie. That's an interesting case because that was kind of almost a turning point for us in the terms of let's do like the heaviest, most pure proggy prog prog that ever prog. And um, it, actually i don't want to say it wasn't well received but it didn't do what we expected and that's part of the reason we just kind of said hey maybe it's okay just to rock out a little bit and do that and people actually wound up really liking it because you know we we once again kind of simplified a bit maybe but valkyrie to me is a very cool very deep very interesting album so maybe a little overload for some people maybe it's hard know. to imagine when you're talking about fans of this genre but who knows yeah so there's two other kind of uh, deep cuts that if people want to check out, they might uh, turn to those and, and see what they sound like. There you go. So a lot of music to investigate in the Glass Hammer catalog, but make sure to check out the brand new one, Dreaming City. It's out right now. A lot of different flavors on the album, I think. Uh, and you know what? If you're brand new to Glass Hammer, not a bad place to start with either, right? Work your way yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, it's rocking. It's proggy. It's got some tender moments as well. It's melodic. It's, it's got all the elements that you expect and then some for the longtime fans and that's and then some so i want to give some special thanks here to both steve and fred for joining us today uh you want to give any links to any uh sites and things that people should check well, out the, easy, the easiest one is www.glasshammer.com i mean that's that's where you can find out everything so uh we we do have a, a growing twitter following uh easy to find and all those links are on glasshammer.com facebook groups and we'd love to hear from fans so you can message us through Facebook or, or Twitter. Uh, there's even a, a kind of a, an anemic uh, Instagram account for Glass Hammer. I mean, I'm like, I started it and I'm like, well, we're just going to show pictures of old dudes. And then, you know, it's, <laughs> what's to see? <laughs> I don't know what to do with Instagram either, guys. I started one up. I haven't put a damn thing on it. I don't know what to do. That's, that's, that's like, these kids. Are, you know, <laughs> kids on our Instagram. <laughs> yeah, but definitely uh, people that want to talk, even on, we have a YouTube channel, just leave comments, leave good comments that I don't have to delete. 
There you go. Yeah, that, that can be a challenge nowadays, I know, trust me. <laughs> so everybody, make sure to visit us on the web at www.chtranquility.org. In fact, if you want to hear and read about any of these albums we talked about today, there's reviews of just about every Glass Hammer album that was ever recorded on our website at chtranquility.org. So go check them out. Uh, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. But this is here on YouTube all the damn time because we're here every single day. So again, thanks to Steve Babb and Fred Schendel, and Glass Hammer, go check out their new album, and we'll see you guys all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.